Good afternoon and welcome to Walker and Dunlop's Wednesday webinar. I'm Susan Weber, your moderator. I would like to welcome Willie Walker and Dr. Wayne Frederick, president of Howard University. Willie and Dr. Frederick will discuss Howard Medical Center's response to COVID-19, successful recruitment strategies for building a diverse workforce, racial justice in America, and considerations for bringing students back to campuses in September. Thank you for joining us. And now I will turn the call over to Willie. Thank you, Susan, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, wonderful to have you all here for another Walker webcast. If it's Wednesday, it's the Walker webcast. Uh, it's an honor and a true pleasure to have Dr. Wayne Frederick with me today, president of Howard University, um, to talk about going back to school, the COVID pandemic, racial justice, and how we can all take action during these challenging times to promote diversity and inclusion in our society. My guest last week was PNC CEO Bill Demchak, who provided a wonderful insight into the banking world and leading on issues of diversity. Uh, it was pretty clear from Bill's comments that the pain from the COVID shutdown is still to come in the banking sector, but that PNC and other big banks are exceedingly well capitalized and ready to weather uh, the storm. Uh, PNC's commitment of $1 billion to invest in communities and racial diversity is exemplary. Uh, but as Bill and I discussed, doing a better job of recruiting, training, promoting, and retaining minorities and women must be addressed with quantifiable goals and day-to-day -day efforts. I'm very excited that former Bernado CEO and commercial real estate legend Mike Facitelli will be joining me next week on the Walker webcast. Uh, from Mike's early days running real estate investment banking at Goldman Sachs to building Bernado into one of the world's largest REITs to his current role as an investor and advisor to some of the smartest capital and commercial real estate. Mike has always been one of the most insightful voices in real estate. We'll follow up Mike Facitelli with Dr. Larry Sabato, founder and director of the University of Virginia Center for, Center for Politics. Larry has been a consistent guest at the Walker Dunlop Summer Conference in Sun Valley, Idaho, and his insights into politics at the local and national level are as good as you will find. So please join me for both of those webcasts over the next two weeks. Finally, before I turn my discussion uh, to my discussion with Dr. Frederick, a couple quick notes on the markets. Uh, capital continues to flow to multifamily, industrial, and office assets. Many of the multifamily assets that came to Walker and Dunlop for forbearance at the beginning of the COVID crisis are in the process of getting current. Uh, we've seen very few new requests for forbearance. Uh, as some of you may have seen, Fannie and Freddie's multifamily forbearance requests increased to $12.2 billion at the end of June, uh, largely due to a senior's housing portfolio owned by Blackstone that requested forbearance. Um, I would note that CoStar just published their quarterly multifamily update, and I would strongly recommending, re recommend watching uh, John Affleck's summary of market conditions. Uh, in that summary, John underscores the strength in the suburban markets over urban markets. And he also underscores the very significant rent decreases taking place in high rent areas such as San Jose and San Francisco. Um, as I mentioned on the webcast last week, we're seeing increased sales activity of multifamily properties heading into Q3. We're still seeing very robust refinancing volumes as base rates and spreads remain low. And we actually closed on a $10 million hospitality construction loan. So we actually closed on a hotel construction loan last week. Um, a first since uh, COVID hit. So um, while the markets are anything but back to their normal um, state, um, we are seeing some thawing in various sectors. So let me turn to Dr. Frederick. Uh, first of all, Wayne, it's, it's a real joy to have you with me today. And I greatly appreciate someone who has as busy a schedule as you do, um, taking the time out uh, to discuss what you are seeing in the world today. Um, as an introduction, Dr. Frederick was born in Port of Spain, Trinidad, and graduated from high school at the age of 14. Uh, he enrolled at Howard University at the age of 16 and had completed his bachelor's degree and his medical degree by age 22. Uh, he performed his oncology fellowship at the MD Anderson Cancer Center at the University of Texas. Dr. Frederick was named the 17th president of Howard University in 2014 and sits on the board of Humana Mutual of America, the US Chamber of Commerce, the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, and is also chairman of the Consortium of Universities of the Washington Metropolitan Area. There is so much to discuss with Dr. Frederick, and I'm extremely thankful for his time and thoughts today. 
Uh, Dr. Frederick, it's hard to fully comprehend all of the challenges, both professional and personal, that have come your way in 2020. First, a global pandemic required you to shut down the university you run. Uh, second, the pandemic required Howard University Hospital to continue providing care under exceedingly challenging circumstances. And third, the murder of George Floyd and subsequent social uprising generated a huge amount of emotional pain and suffering in the African American community. I read the following quote from you, quote, when things are really going haywire and you're in the midst of a crisis in the operating room, some blood vessel has gotten away and is bleeding profusely. I don't get to yell and scream and throw some instruments around the room and stomp my feet. I actually have to become more focused. I have to become even calmer to manage that crisis. I have to find that blood vessel, get control of it, and make sure everything is okay, unquote. So how have you remained focused, maintained control, and made sure that everything is okay during such challenging times? Yeah, well, really, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I would say with great difficulty, I, I, I don't by any means um, want to make it seem like it's simple to do. My uh, mentor, Dr. LaSalle LaFall, who was chair at surgery and, and the first African-American uh, president of the American Cancer Society, American College of Surgeons, had a saying, equanimity under duress. And that is a, a surgical principle um, that all of us who train at Howard um, continue to, to use. And I try to do the same thing uh, in the middle of these crises. Uh, while all the noise is taking place, and I think everybody's um, reaction is usually to have a knee-jerk reaction to do the, the next thing because we always want to feel that we have to do something. I actually try to get everybody to slow down and think about you know, what we must do. And so bringing my teams together and having some conversations about you know, what we needed to do next and how we should do it and, and getting everybody uh, to really rally around uh, the conversation about what we should do and, and how to do it, I think was important, as well as listening. Uh, lots of times in a, crisis, in a crisis, I think a leader wants to demonstrate leadership and we sometimes falsely believe that that means that we have to act. And I think a lot of times what we have to really do is to listen. And I think what we tend to hear in those listening moments tend to be instructive and actually give us a good indication of what we should do. And so that's what I've been trying to do as well, to make sure that I'm listening to you know, my students, my faculty and staff, and then uh, making sure that we're coming up with the right types of reaction to it. You mentioned Dr. LaSalle Fall, um, someone whom we both knew uh, quite well. And there's a quote I read of Dr. LaFalle's of maintain that degree of calmness and tranquility because that will allow you to do as appropriate in any circumstance. Um, and at the same time, uh, I've also read that, you know, in the operating room where you go still on a consistent basis, which is unbelievable given the demands on your time as president of a major university. Um, but in the, in the operating room, you are the ultimate boss. You have complete control of that environment. Um, to, 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 to be outside of the operating room and to be in the seat that you've been sitting in with everything that's been going on has to have been incredibly challenging. You don't control the tempo. You don't control the, the, the dialogue, if you will. How have you been able to manage through the pressures on you to make statements? I mean, I, I heard you say you've been listening, but at the same time, all eyes are also on you as one of the very prominent African-American leaders in the United States today. Yeah, you know, it's been, it's a very good point. And sometimes people ask me why I continue to operate. And I tell them that the, the strange thing is that the operating room uh, is quiet. Nobody's there telling me what to do. There's no constituency that's, uh, you know, speaking. I, I'm not trying to, to juggle um, who this is going to, you know, tick off versus who this is going to please and, and trying to find middle ground. I'm there to do a job. And the other thing about that is that the gratitude that patients have, especially uh, operating on cancer patients, sometimes I do come out of that room with not the greatest of news. And I still meet families with courage and, and gratitude and, and hope, and they get up and hug you. And it was one of the most, in, I would say, most, one of the most incredible feelings that you can have about humanity and understanding it. Uh, the job as president is the opposite of that. It's the most thankless job in America, probably. And uh, nothing that you do pleases anyone. You know, there's a board member, you get good financial results, the board members tell you don't 
uh, over celebrate. <laughs> you you try to communicate those uh, financial results to the rest of the constituency. They're like, well, you don't need any money. You should give us a raise. You know that type of thing. They don't see the challenges, and so yeah, it is it is that juxtaposition. But I do think that operating in both of those worlds um, does help me to keep and even keel and, and make me recognize what's important. And that's what I've tried to do. So yes, uh, having financial strain is difficult. Um, being in, in the middle of a pandemic and trying to juggle navigating your way to it is difficult. Uh, but uh, I, I've operated during the pandemic, um, patients with esophageal cancer, pa you know, patient with a stomach cancer, et cetera, and seeing those patients uh, navigate that circumstance just, you know, gives you a grounding of what's really important and some of the things that we all fuss about in our daily lives um, that give us perspective. And I think if you run a major university like Howard, um, like that, it helps you with that listening as well, because those statements end up um, becoming a mosaic of a lot of input uh, from others. Your comment as it relates to putting everything into perspective and thinking about those patients that you um, operated on during the pandemic and, and putting their pain and suffering in the context of what all of us were doing is, is, is super helpful. You were diagnosed with sickle cell anemia at birth. Um, I'm assuming many of our listeners don't know exactly what sickle cell anemia is and, 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 and what it is like to have it. Can you describe for a moment what the disease is and, and, and how you manage having sickle cell anemia? Sure. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder that affects your hemoglobin, which is the protein um, in, your, in our red blood cells that carries oxygen. Uh, there's, it, it's one of the most studied and known about genetic disorders because it demonstrates that when you just have one amino acid, which is the smallest product of a protein um, in the wrong place in a genetic sequencing code, um, it, you can have such a dramatic change. And what happens when I get into a deoxygenated state, um, such as overexertion, overly stressed, um, high altitude, uh, that hemoglobin molecule uh, becomes very, very stiff and it, it deforms the cells and those cells become sickled and they can get stuck in your blood vessels, et cetera. So, you know, in young kids, for instance, um, that can result in strokes. And I've met, um, you know, teenagers with sickle cell who had strokes when they were five and six. Uh, the life expectancy uh, is, has also been significantly shortened as well. And so the primary manifestation of it is the pain that you get in those deoxygenated states because the blood vessels, especially at your joints, uh, get clogged with those red blood cells. And that pain is, is pretty severe. I've broken an arm and a leg, both playing soccer, and I have not experienced the kind of pain that I get um, from a sickle cell crisis. So it can be a very debilitating uh, disorder. So with that as the backdrop, let me try and understand a little bit how you are where you are today. Because you know, when you're at MD Anderson doing your oncology fellowship, it's pretty clear that you're gonna be one of the very, very best cancer surgeons in the, in, in the United States, if not in the world. And you have the opportunity to basically control your world, be an incredible physician and um, you know, raise a family and, 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 and proceed forward, if you will. And I'm not trying to say that's just being a surgeon because we need more surgeons and you, would have, you still are a fantastic one. But what was the turning point in your career that got you focused on um, academia, um, administration, and now finding yourself in a job that quite honestly has a schedule that is incredibly busy, is incredibly stressful, and quite honestly probably um, causes the sickle cell to come back on a more frequent basis than if you had just stayed the course of being a surgeon? Yeah, you know, c coming to Howard was key. Um, Howard University has a sickle cell center, uh, which they've had since the year of my birth in 1971. And meeting peers with sickle cell, um, getting counseling in that group, uh, also uh, just learning about my disease process was really, really important. Learning what my triggers um, were, uh, I think was critical to how I managed my disease and, and how I was able to put things in perspective. Uh, Dr. LaFour was a big influence and so he being an academic surgeon, uh, one of the first hurdles I had to kind of get over was 
uh, whether or not I could even do general surgery. At that time, we would take 16 residents and uh, only six would finish. We used to call it a permit program. Uh, fortunately, that's illegal now, but back then it wasn't. Uh, that attrition was, was very high and, and it was stressful, but I had learned uh, some, te some techniques to cope. And yes, I did get sick while doing my residency and I had to put that in perspective, but his influence was important. I also had um, a, a, an opportunity to meet with Ben Carson when I was a resident. I reached out to him and my mom was a, a big fan of his book and his career. And he was gracious enough to meet with me for about 35 to 40 minutes uh, up at Hopkins. I traveled up to Baltimore and I told him I wanted to become a surgeon. And I wasn't sure if this was something I could do. Uh, he said to me he had never met somebody with sickle cell who was a surgeon. I still haven't met someone myself. Um, but, you know, he, he really encouraged me in that little period of time. And I think sometimes we don't appreciate how if we just stop ourselves long enough to smile at someone or to give a kind word of advice, how big an influence it could be. And I thought to myself, he is one of the greatest neurosurgeons of our time um, who took time to meet a medical student, not from his medical school, uh, but from Howard and, uh, you know, encouraged me to, to do it and to go after it. And so I always felt I wanted to be in an academic setting uh, because of the ability to teach. And I, I enjoyed that aspect of my training. And I thought that uh, if I could stay in that realm, I'll do it. I will admit that I'm probably a reluctant president because I never had any um, ideas of becoming a university president. Uh, and some of this happened, you know, uh, I would say kind of because of circumstances in the right place at the right time. As I tell young people, I always prepared myself well. I got my MBA while being a full-time faculty member at Howard as a surgeon. Um, but I, I, try to be aspirational about the things I want to do and not necessarily ambitious. And yes, it's a stressful job. Uh, it's time consuming without a doubt. Um, but I think a lot of the techniques that I've learned earlier on in my life uh, to cool um, have really proven to be helpful. It's really interesting. Your, your comments about Dr. Carson um, remind me of um, when you were doing your medical studies at, at, uh, at Howard and, the, and having worked with Kurt Newman over at Children's Hospital where I'm on the board and, and Kurt is a, a friend of both of ours. But Kurt is, I believe, one of only 5% of hospital administrators in the United States today are actually physicians by training. Um, it, it must be a huge advantage for you to not only have the training of being a medical doctor, but then in your management of both the hospital and the University at Howard to be a physician. Is there anything where other than just the core training that comes into play? I mean, we started this conversation off talking about, you know, sort of stay calm. You're, when you're dealing with life and death issues, you, you must take a deep breath. Anything else that it allows you to do as an administrator, given your training as a physician? Yeah, definitely. I, I tell people I was a patient long before I was a physician, and that probably uh, is what influences and instructs me more than anything else, because uh, getting sick frequently and being hospitalized frequently as a child growing up, um, you see hospitals from a bed and you see them in terms of how they work. So I tell people I kind of grew up in hospitals. I understand exactly how they work. I understand the rules that people have in them. And I think that that has been a major advantage. I've spent all of my life uh, in a hospital, practically. Uh, the other thing that I think is helpful is, you know, most physicians, um, when it comes to the business of medicine, are not very involved in it and don't become very immersed in it for several reasons. Uh, part of it is our medical curriculum that probably needs to be, needs to be changed. And once you do develop some type of an interest, um, the very people who it seems, you know, shut us out from that aspect of it, actually welcome it. You know, they, they want you there at the table. They want you to be curious about uh, the procurement process. They want you to be curious about the revenue cycle and, and to understand it. And when you demonstrate that, I think people are willing to, to bring you in. And I think being a physician, it helps because I can have a discussion about how the operating room works, um, you know, with an administrator. Um, but it's a very different conversation. When I tell that person last week, I showed up for my seven o'clock case and you know, everything was ready at 6.30 and I'm, I'm grateful. That's a very different conversation because they immediately understand when we talk about operating room times, 
I check my own operating room times uh, frequently and, and make sure. So it does give you a different insight. And I think in this circumstance, uh, in the situation that we're in with a pandemic, it also, I think, helps um, our decision making as a team uh, better because the science of it is something that I understand and appreciate and respect um, as well. And I think that that's a big part of what our decision making is, called for, is calling for in this particular moment as well. It's fascinating to think about that in the business context where we all try and focus on our customer and all want to know our customer better. You've come to your profession and career having been the ultimate customer, if you will, and it obviously gives you great insight into how to meet the customer's needs. Um, let me shift for a moment, Dr. Frederick, to uh, going back to school. Um, in, a, in a letter that you wrote to the Howard community, you, you wrote, we are planning for a hybrid academic model where some students and faculty will be in the classroom and others will be online. The decision on which students and faculty meet face-to-face -face will be made based on health risks to faculty, staff, and students regarding underlying medical conditions or concerns over transmission, academic discipline, and course comment, com content, as well as a degree attainment and accreditation requirements. So how do you determine the health risk to faculty, staff, and students given the second wave of COVID virus we are currently experiencing? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's definitely very concerning. Um, when I think of the health risk, it, back in mid-April when we thought we hit our peak and we're coming down on the other side of the proverbial curve, um, I, I felt, um, you know, fairly confident that we could do this safely. Uh, as I sit here today, I am extremely concerned if we can. We actually have more cases right now than we did in that mid-April mid time. The death rate has not risen. Um, but we just had a July 4th holiday weekend in which uh, several people all around the country were not social distancing, not wearing masks. And I am concerned that that uh, would cause further transmission. And we'll see the impact of that over the course of the next 10 to you know, 15 days. Um, we bring students from uh, you know, 46 states and about 71 countries. Uh, that's a, a milieu... Uh, for putting stuff in a Petri dish uh, that could be explosive. And so we have to be thoughtful about that. Uh, we're continuing to move forward with our hybrid model um, with robust testing, but we are, are going to be very willing to pull that down and go fully online if we just don't think uh, the societal circumstance is going to accommodate what we do. Uh, the other thing I would say about this is that uh, Howard is in a unique circumstance uh, the coronavirus um, infection has uh, disproportionately affected African-Americans. Uh, I employ more African-American faculty than any other higher ed institution in this country. And so I have a moral obligation uh, to make sure that I don't put them at risk. And for those of them who have underlying uh, pre-existing conditions, um, they would be at risk for death if they were to contract this. So we do have in my opinion, a higher bar to do that. We have to balance that as well against the fact that we also educate a significant number of low-income students. And one of the things that they do get from Howard is being in an environment where they can socialize and also develop soft skills and uh, grow their confidence uh, that's, that's outside of an environment that structurally um, disadvantages them. And, and Howard uh, tends to remove some of that and help them gain that confidence and experience and so, so we are trying to balance that as well. And doing that online is not the same um, without a doubt. And we want to make sure that those young people don't lose ground as well. You mentioned, Dr. Frederick, the, the disproportionate impact that COVID has had on the African-American community. In Washington, D.C., 80% of the deaths in Washington have been uh, to African-Americans. Do you think this disproportionate impact is due to access to health care the density of the communities where African-Americans live, the underlying health conditions in the African-American population or something else or a combination of all? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a combination of that as well as something that I would refer to as weathering, um, which I think is a concept that most people don't appreciate. And that is that over time, if you live in adverse conditions uh, that are piled up against you, that consistent uh, continuous weathering also decreases uh, your ability to participate in the society fully. And I'll give you an example right here in DC. Uh, Ward 3 is 95% white by population. 
Uh, the life expectancy there on average is about 87, 88 years. Uh, and if you go to Ward 7 and 8, where it's 95% African-American, the life expectancy of an African-American male uh, is not quite at 70 years. It's in 60, 67 or 68 years. That difference in a city of this size, you're talking about just a few miles apart, um, human beings with the same types of organs and could potentially have very similar genetic makeup, same risk factors, uh, have a completely different health outcome experience. They have less access to care. You don't have an acute care facility um, in what seven and eight where you can deliver a baby. So if you're a pregnant mother getting prenatal care and actually doing a delivery, you have to come across the river to one of the other wards. Um, you don't have but two uh, full service groceries in Ward 7 and 8 that serve about 170,000 residents. So again, if you're looking for nutritious food, um, you're looking for fresh vegetables, that's not as simple a task as um, one may think. And I can go on and on in terms of uh, not having that access. And so when that happens and then you have a virus like this that uh, is going to really adversely affect people with uh, comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, the incidence there is, is incredible. And this is the nation's capital. If you look at the maternal mortality rate, the incidence of end-stage renal disease in the city, you would not be sure that you were even in America. And that's a, a, an unfortunately um, a hidden truth that exists right here in our city and something that we have to undo. So yes, there, there are significant disadvantages regardless of all the prosperity uh, that has been occurring in the city over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, but the resources just have not been applied evenly um, across these eight wards. And, and if we don't have an intervention, it, it, it's going to worsen. The other thing I'll say as well is the, the other thing about weathering is that incidents like this pandemic actually double down on that weathering. So what you're going to see now with the disproportionate African-American unemployment uh, which is traditionally significantly higher than the average for the country, is you, again, are going to give another dent to, to generational wealth because of the number of people who've been lost as breadwinners and because of people who are going to have chronic lung issues and other things like that and can't necessarily live productive lives. And you just can't build wealth to the same, uh, to the same degree if you live 20 years younger than someone else. I mean, compound interest uh, just doesn't work in debt. And so we have to recognize that when we even talk about generational wealth, we have to get people to live long enough uh, to even get there. And, and that's a challenge for African-Americans. I, I, it's, so uh, there's a lot in there that I want to unpack. Um, I guess the, the first one would be, to your point, as it relates to wealth, um, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, where you sit on the board, I read a research report yesterday talking about financially distressed communities and how COVID has run more rampant in those communities, predominantly due to the fact that many of the people who live in those communities work in the hospitality and the leisure sectors. And so they're being, if you will, forced back to the front lines as hospitality and leisure comes back online, getting them interacting with people and therefore increasing the infection rate, which will both devastate those communities from a health standpoint, and then to your point, also hit them from an economic standpoint. It was interesting to see that the you know, Federal Reserve Bank was focusing on that financial qualifier to a health issue. Yeah, I, I, I think it's been, it's been critical. You know, I've, I've been a board member of the Federal Reserve Bank. This is going into my fourth year. And um, it, it, it has been really uh, eye-opening to see the transition, to see the focus um, on underserved communities, et cetera, at the bank. You know, Tom Barkin, who is the president of the Richmond Bank, um, the fifth district uh, where I'm on the board, has done a lot of outreach in terms of getting into the communities to talk about these things and also exposing him himself as well to that. I think even my addition to the board uh, was really looking at that issue. I, I, I see a lot of low-income students. We have a hospital that serves an underserved community. And so I bring a slightly different perspective. When, I, when people talk about the unemployment rate, um, you know, I'm often asking about what it is for African-Americans and, and demonstrating uh, how wide that gap is. And yes, that, that issue 
that you just mentioned, um, it has several different aspects to it. Uh, just think about someone who uh, currently is working in a hospital as an orderly um, and they are traveling maybe on two buses to get to one of our hospitals on this side of the city from Southeast and they contract the virus, they go home, um, they, they're told to self-isolate and or quarantine in a one bedroom apartment with two or three kids who live there as well. Uh, there's just no way for them to avoid that. There's no way for them to, uh, to get away from that. They may get, have a face covering, but they may not have access to masks. And so all of those things, I think, compound the issue. And I do think it's, it's admirable uh, for the Federal Reserve um, to really look at it. And the last thing I'll say is, I think if you look at the data, both in terms of healthcare and in terms of the overall economy, if we spend time lifting up the least of us, uh, the entire country is way better for it and much wealthier. I know in health, we spend more money in the last year of life um, than we do on prevention, as an example. And so you think of the sickest of us, if we could prevent them um, from getting sick, especially when they're younger, um, what that would do to our healthcare expenditure on GDP if, if we put a lot of that money up front in terms of preventing things like hypertension, et cetera. And, and that prevention is not just about medications and screenings, but it is about providing nutritious meals and safe places that people can live and access to quality healthcare as well. As you talk about the disparities and going back to your comment of somebody who lives in Ward 3 versus Ward 7 of Washington, um, on the, on the COVID pandemic, you've been very prescriptive as it relates to, you know, all solutions don't fit all communities to the extent where, you know, drive-through testing sounds like a great thing, except for in many communities, particularly in some African-American communities, not everyone has a car to hop in and go through a drive-through testing facility. Is there anything that we really ought to be focused on right now, Dr. Frederick, as it relates to addressing the needs of the African-American community uh, related to COVID? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's several things. That you mentioned one that I've mentioned before on interviews that I think uh, how, where we put testing and so how it has tried to play a role there. We put up a testing site in Ward 7 and uh, we, we've also taken away the barrier of having to have symptoms, et cetera, because we recognize so many people are asymptomatic and encouraging um, people to, to come and get tested. A uh, second one that as we look down um, the road that we need to start thinking about um, is, vac uh, is a vaccine and vaccine trials. Um, this virus accesses the body through an ACE uh, receptor. Um, we have developed antihypertensives as a medical community that are ACE inhibitors. Uh, and some of those drugs did not work as well in African-Americans. So I do have a concern that there is potential that the reaction to a vaccine may not be the same. And as we start building out clinical trials, if we don't enroll enough African-Americans uh, and they're disproportionately affected, and in my opinion, we need to get uh, the vaccine uh, more so than anyone else, we could have an issue. So Howard is uh, trying to get involved with the vaccine trials, both on the si side of the science and in terms of recruiting uh, patients. I think that's another aspect of what we have to do. And then the third thing is, especially as the government is thinking of another relief package, I think one of the things that we need to look at is infrastructure um, opportunities. Uh, as you just pointed out, as people are returning back to um, the hospitality industry and so on, uh, I think a concerted, specific effort uh, that looks at those workers and trying to get them assistance, not just around uh, dollars, but around things like PPE, um, transportation, and so on. Because if we protect them, from getting the virus and spreading it, we actually, as a country, I think will do better in terms of the use of our medical resources, such as our ICUs, our ventilators, et cetera, you know, as we move forward. As it relates to, you know, what's your outlook as it relates to therapeutics and a vaccine and when we can realistically think that we're gonna be able to both fight the disease. I was, I was just looking at the numbers this morning, Dr. Frederick, as it relates to the morbidity rate in the United States versus Russia and India. And my assumption would have been that given the medical infrastructure that we have in the United States, that our 
uh, the morbidity rate would be well below Russian and India, and it's actually much higher than Russian and, and India. Now, the virus has been here longer. It is spread more widely, but just on a percentage basis, we're losing more people to this virus than two countries that are, are, are far less developed from a medical standpoint than we are. Um, but you're on the front lines. You, you, you're on the board of Humana, and you see what Humana is doing as well as what many of the um, drug makers are doing. What's What's the... What's your outlook as it relates to, are we, are we going to get some therapeutics this fall? Are we going to get a vaccine early in 2001? Or is that all just the markets trying to say, hey, hope is coming, but not realistic that we'll get it by then? Yeah, well, you know, what I'll tell you, this has been an unprecedented um, effort in the medical community, which is usually more competitive around vaccine development or, or Medicaid therapeutic development because of uh, the economics. Uh, but I think that, that, that this has represented um, unprecedented collaboration. And I think as a result of that, um, it will yield results. It's hard to say when, but I think it would be unprecedented in terms of how quickly uh, we get to a vaccine and how quickly we get to therapeutics. Now, I think most lay people don't realize that these things usually take traditionally years to develop. Um, and we are consistently talking about something happening within 24 months of the first case and the, or the first case reports um, being spoken about. And, and within 24 months mean, means by December of 2021, and that's unprecedented. Uh, and I think that um, as, a, uh, you know, as a medical community, we're gonna get there, um, both in terms of a therapeutic as well as in terms of vaccine. And, and I think that that says a lot for uh, the nature of this entire pandemic uh, on a, uh, of, of itself. So if we, if we go back to bringing students back to school in the fall, um, you know, Howard is located right in the heart of Washington, D.C. Um, and it's as urban a university community as you can almost find in the country. I was sitting around thinking about it and, you know, maybe NYU is a more urban located uh, university, but Howard is right in the middle of it. So if there is an outbreak of COVID at Howard in the fall, is it realistic to think that you can quarantine students or control the outbreak? And, 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 and what, if, what if you do have to shut the university down again um, if you do bring students back? Yeah, it, it, I think it's realistic uh, to believe that we can now quarantine, especially with a hospital, um, having the campus de-densified, having the number of students uh, in dorms uh, decreased, all of those things. Uh, are things that will assist us in being able to, uh, I think, control an outbreak. Um, having said that, the more contagious version of this as a result of the recent mutations uh, does concern me. And so it does also require, we, we will require a lot of cooperation by everyone in terms of uh, contact tracing, being able to tell where people have been, what classroom they were in, um, who else was in the classroom, being able to test those people. Uh, testing is going to be critical in terms of a quick turnaround. And we've secured uh, a, a free testing solution in which we will have a, a clear certified lab uh, stood up at Howard and be doing testing that has a turnaround time of three hours or less. And, and it's key. You don't want people um, out for you know, several days or, or a week. You want to be able to turn that around quickly. I think that's going to help us as well. And we've identified spaces in the dorm that we would put people um, and group them in terms of being able uh, to have them isolated. So I, I do think that there is uh, an opportunity for us to do that safely. Um, is it risky? And, and if it does get out of control, um, do we have to make a decision to shut down? Absolutely. But the other thing we have to define is what is out of control? What, what, what really is that kind of trigger uh, that gets you there, and that's up for debate, and that's something that we're we're talking about, you know, actively, especially with young people, um, you know, who may be asymptomatic or, for that matter, have mild forms of the disease. Uh, you could get some blunting of interest in terms of people even getting tested or coming forward, um, et cetera. So I'm spending a lot of time. We had a town hall yesterday, in which uh, some senior administrators communicated to. Uh, a group of people that we wanted them to be cautious about what we would um, what we were doing, and we needed to rely on them being accountable. 
and I'm going to continue that messaging. You know, um, we're not going to have anybody sign waivers. We're not going to have anybody sign a pledge. Uh, I feel that we have to be thinking about the communal good. And ultimately, if everyone um, is responsible and acts responsibly, it's going to get us there. So your response, Dr. Frederick, um, on that specific question is probably similar to most university presidents across the United States. Um, now I'm going to add the complex layer that you have, not uniquely, but you and a few other college presidents have, which is that it's my assumption that Howard students have been participants and in many instances leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement across the country over the past month. And Howard obviously has a long list of prominent African American leaders such as Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, Governor Doug Wilder, Mayor Adrian Fenty, and potential Biden running mate Senator Kamala Harris. How are you going to manage the significant health concerns of congregating and protesting with the long-standing expectation that Howard students will be leaders on racial justice issues, given the backdrop of what you just talked about of managing the campus and managing the COVID outbreak? Yeah, you know, the, the, the march uh, for, for social justice is, is a, a long one and, and one that Howard has gotten involved in from its inception back in 1867. And right now we're in a moment where lots of other people are joining that journey, and we're thankful for that. Um, the reality is, based on uh, history, um, some of those people are going to leave the journey as well at some point. Um, and how it is not going to, we're going to continue. So in this moment, uh, you know, what we have to do is focus on the outcomes. And what I've been talking to my community about is you know, that we have to keep our head down and keep doing the things that we were doing. While everybody is concerned and jumping in um, right now, we have to welcome them, be welcoming, but we still have to keep focus on doing the things that we need to do to right the wrongs and the ills of our society. And that's what we're going to continue doing. Uh, we have to educate our students and our community about the risk of how that's done. And so we have start, we're going to be starting a series uh, called From Protest to Policy, uh, where we're going to be doing some uh, webinars and symposia directed at our students and the rest of our community uh, to get them kind of focused on what are the solutions around here. Um, what, what the discussion about reparations, where did that come from? Uh, what is the basis for it? What does it look like? And how can we uh, bring solutions around some of uh, the injustices? Uh, we, we're going to launch an innovation uh, center most of these are focused on uh, technology and uh, associated with STEM. Uh, we're going to launch one where the core is social entrepreneurship. And we've been developing this for the past 12 to 18 months, long before uh, this struck. And what we're going to try to do is to have students, we're going to wrap it with social sciences and humanities and have students um, be able to engage with big data and technology, as well as venture capitalists to recognize that they could turn uh, the, the activity that seeks to close income inequality, look at problems like income inequality, criminal justice reform, they can not only turn those things into careers, but they can turn them into uh, social entrepreneurship opportunities as well. And I think that uh, we can mobilize. So the, the point here is that uh, protesting is an aspect of what we do, uh, but it's just one aspect of what they're going to do. And, and they can do that in a responsible and safe manner and a healthy manner. But ultimately, what I think uh, we need to get them focused on and doing is really working on what the solutions are. We're going to try to provide them with many an opportunity to learn about it as well as to get there as well. So I've given talks at Howard. I've recruited at Howard. I've given talks at Morehouse, and I've recruited at Morehouse. And um, it is not easy to gain traction as it relates to recruiting talented African Americans to corporate America. What would you give as suggestions to the many, many corporate leaders who are watching this webinar today as it relates to how to get engaged and how to be successful at recruiting people of color into their companies? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think my students are looking for a long-term relationship. Uh, they're looking for people who are committed. Um, Jamie Dimon uh, started coming to Howard University to recruit back in 1989. Um, in 2015, I had him back as my Charter Day speaker, and, J and JP Morgan has set up a, a, a relationship with 
um, Howard University where they have students who participate in internships and so on. We have a luncheon after, um, and obviously the luncheon is to honor uh, the orator at Charter Day. Um, he told me he was going to go meet with some students, uh, 20 students in that J.P. Morgan program, and he'd be right up. I went up to the luncheon. I explained to everybody where he was. Uh, we said the invocation. We ate. We were done. I walked back downstairs, uh, went to the building and the room that he was meeting these students in, and he was still there. So students see him and that company as they have a relationship with the CEO. The CEO is going to show up, miss a luncheon because he's answering every single question of every one of them. I recognize that every CEO can do that at every historically black college in America. I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that. But I think when people come to recruit, they have to recognize that students are looking for, they, they already uh, suspect that the environment may not um, look like them and may be unfamiliar, and so they want some familiarity. The second thing I try to tell people is that it's a longitudinal process. So it's not a when is career day, you show up on campus, pitch your tent, and you leave. Uh, the companies that are successful with my students, um, you know, reach out to them during their exams. They, they make a schedule and they remember to reach out to them. They call them on their birthdays. They call them randomly to find out how they're doing. They call them when there's activity in the country that they think may adversely affect them. And then the last thing is what we've been doing uh, under my leadership, which is looking at workforce development. And so our project with Google that started as Howard West was an example of that. I've tried to convince companies to invest in the education of my students so that they will be better employees and that that, that recruitment starts with their education. And so at um, Google, uh, what I pitched to Google was let my students come out there and actually live and breathe your ear. Um, your Google engineers uh, should teach them in the curriculum, um, not a traditional internship. A lot of my students can't afford to do an unpaid internship, or for that matter, even just flying out to California is a concern that they have. Those students now go out there and spend an entire academic year being taught by Google engineers and Howard faculty. And I think that uh, Google, uh, just like Howard, have, has been very impressed with what that has done for workforce development. So lots of companies that I talk to now, I say to them, you know, why not look at our curriculum, look at a course that you think you can influence, and what better way to have your company be exposed to my students than in the educational process as opposed to you recruiting them at the end of their time. You train them, you spend a lot of money the first two years, and then somebody, you're one of your competitors gets them. And I think you can short circuit that as well as create a very different environment for students who, as you just mentioned, may be more skeptical of corporate America. Yeah, you know, I had your one of your trustees um, and graduates, Leslie Hale, on the webcast a couple of weeks ago. And um, uh, Leslie being the first African-American female CEO of a publicly traded REIT in the United States. During our conversation, Wayne, she said, you know, I'm not a unicorn. Um, and people need to look for talent like me just in different places. Beyond being better at recruiting at universities like Howard, what can both your graduates, you send, you know, 2,200 very, very talented graduates into the workforce every year, and those of us who run companies are receiving them in, what, what should both sides of that equation, if you will, do a better job of to make sure that, you know, Leslie Hale isn't a unicorn 10 years from now um, in corporate America? Yeah, you know, I, I think there are a few things. I think you have to be willing to go to where the students are. You know, I, I often hear, um, you know, companies say it's hard to find qualified students who are African-American. Well, there are 103 HBCUs in this country. 80% um, plus of the students are African-American. Uh, we award 22% uh, of the bachelor's degrees despite being only 3% of the institutions. So it seems to me like, you know, if you want to get water, you're going to go to a well uh, that has water in it. And... I would say the HBCUs um, add that well when it comes to African-American talent. Uh, the second thing is, I, 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 would, I would say is, um, you know, I, I think sometimes in recruitment, we, we, we think of, and I see it at career fairs at Howard, um, 
you know, the, the one or two African-Americans who may be in the HR group recruiting get sent out uh, to do the career day. And I tell people all the time that's ineffective. You know, uh, that's not what my students are looking for. What they're looking for is can they relate to that person? They feel that they are exceptionally prepared. So again, if somebody takes the time to look at the curriculum and they take the time to kind of think of, through or even talk to the faculty about what types of jobs they think students are interested in, et cetera, and you send the people who do those jobs uh, or who are leading in those areas and they can have a really fulsome conversation with that student, I think it's a, it's a much more effective uh, circumstance than somebody who's been with the company for two years and this happens to look like them went to another HBCU, uh, we know what they're going to talk about. And that has very little to do with your company and why uh, they should be spending time there. So you talked about the HBCUs. Tell me about McCore Maker coming to Howard and whether that is truly the game changer that many people think it is as it relates to um, first of all, it's just, it's unbelievable that a top 20 high school basketball recruit is coming your way uh, and turning down UCLA and Kentucky to come to Howard. Um, and it's such a wonderful move on his part to basically make an investment, if you will, in the HBCU system. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, when you got that news and then how is it going to change the, 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 the focus on either basketball or more broadly academics at Howard and other HBCUs. Yeah, so you know, it, 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 this is an interesting um, circumstance because he came doing homecoming last year. Um, we it was in the middle of a board meeting. I brought him into the boardroom just to say hi. He and uh, his handler, you know, he is a very pleasant young man. Um, I was give I give a presidential address, and while I was giving it, um, he was in the room, so I introduced him uh, to everyone. Um, Kanye West gave a bit of a, a concert on campus. Uh, I happened to be all there. I saw him there. He had a, a close practice. Um, I was able to sit in the gym and watch him. My point being is that this wasn't a one-off. Um, you know, he, I had a lot of interaction with him uh, to really understand who he was about. And when I met with him, um, it, he was incredible. His, his conversation about academics, he wanted to know about my own journey to Howard and uh, what I saw in our students, he, he asked all the right questions that I would want uh, any recruit, um, athletic or otherwise, to ask. And so I had a good feeling that if we were going to land him, uh, if we're going to land a prospect like this, it, it would be somebody like him. Um, and we've had other recruits come that are pretty high profile. Some of them have shown up with a full camera crew. And I was realistic that that was not who we were, we were going to land. So I, I, I wouldn't say I was completely surprised. I, I had a hunch if we were going to get one, it would be him. Uh, what does it do uh, for the landscape? I don't think people appreciate just how much college athletics contributes uh, to brand and revenue and so on, you know. Um, however, I'm glad that you mentioned academics because what Howard University does with the over, you know, $20 million in scholarships that we give out is that 80% of uh, my athletes graduate. And I think that that is what ultimately uh, the student athlete is about. And I think that that more than anything else is what we have to sell. So we've been on a journey uh, to take athletics in a different direction and to make it look different. Uh, we've been playing marquee teams. We will play Notre Dame this year. Uh, we played UNLV a couple of years ago and had the biggest upset in college football ever. Um, but we also have been playing Ivy League schools. And that's because I want my students, I want my alum, I want parents of uh, potential students uh, to see us on the same fields with people that I feel are just as well academically prepared uh, for college uh, as my students are. And, and they can see their kids um, attending such an institution. So we've had a, a strategy that we've been deploying and uh, this is yet another destination uh, in the fulfillment of that strategy. So it is going to change a lot. We have a 2,700 uh, a seating gym, uh, that might be journalists alone if we're not careful. I would think, I would think you might be bumping Georgetown out of the, out of the uh, Cap One Center <laughs> soon enough and, uh, and having them go over to your gym and, and you taking <laughs> over the Cap One Center. But Dr. Frederick, this, I mean, this is a, it's interesting to me that here's this high schooler who's made a decision to pass up UCLA and Kentucky 
to go to an HBCU um, that could kick off. I mean, if you think about the, the, the number of, I mean, at the height of athletics and at the height of entertainment in America, it is filled with African-Americans at the very, very top levels who have also made huge sums of money. And as I think about the opportunity to turn around and invest in the next generation of African-Americans, I look to those people in the sports world, um, and, and obviously LeBron James has been doing a huge amount, but to look to people like Michael Jordan, who may be giving back to UNC, but might think now um, about giving to an HBCU to build up a program that could be a, 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 to help both from an athletic and as well as from an academic standpoint. And I saw Reed Hastings make his donation where he went to Bowdoin College, but has just given you know $120 million to three HBCUs. This really could be a turning point. And I kind of, I find it to be very interesting that here's this high schooler who's a top 20 pick who is kind of leading this effort. And it's, and it's my hope, and I'm just curious about your opinions on it, whether we could look back 10 or 20 years from now where some of the HBCUs have really become top, top-notch athletic programs in either basketball or football, two sports which are dominated by African-Americans, and it all started with McCurr Maker coming to, to Howard University. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a very, it's a very good point. And, and yes, that, that's obviously the narrative we'd like to see, but I think you can broaden that narrative. The 103 HBCUs have a combined endowment of probably just over $3 billion that represents 10% of Harvard's endowment. And that right there just gives you a perspective. Yet still, Howard University with an endowment of 750 million um, has sent more African-Americans from our undergrad program to uh, medical schools in this country. We send more every year than anyone else. We send more to STEM PhDs than Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and Yale combined. And the combined endowment of those four institutions is probably, depending on how the market did today, probably $95 billion, if not over $100 billion, uh, compared to how it's $750 million. So it is an issue of if we can replace resources um, that probably have been misplaced. And I think that if you can do that, you absolutely will have an impact that's uh, incredible. And athletics is one uh, potential place that that can happen. Uh, without a doubt. But I would say that uh, our calling card at the end of the day, uh, in my opinion, is extremely strong academics. And I think that that's an opportunity for people to invest in um, who want to see probably a more just and, and fairly distributed society in terms of resources. So um, I could, I want to, I jump down that for a while with you as it relates to talking mm -hmm. about how we attract uh, more African Americans to this field of medicine and law and others, but um, we're going to run out of time pretty soon. And so I want to, I want to shift to the, to, to a final question to you, which is that, you know, your, your grandmother played a very large role in your life as a boy and um, her first plane trip actually ever was to a 10 year graduation from Howard. What's the biggest lesson you took from your grandmother and what can all of us keep in mind as we move forward as a country during these challenging times? You know, my, my grandmother turned 96 on June 19th, uh, which was World Sickle Cell Day. Uh, Howard celebrated World Sickle Cell Day and had me as uh, what their keynote speaker. I mentioned that because, you know, as a three-year-old, I overheard her talking about sickle cell and I asked her about it. And uh, I then, she recalls, I responded to her saying I was going to become a doctor. She instilled a confidence in me about that dream that I have never been able to shake. And I always tell people that if you really instill a confidence in a child, uh, there's nothing like it. And I still believe that today. But she would lay in a field in Trinidad and see the first planes come into Trinidad when planes started coming in. That's how long she's been on this earth. And for her to get on that plane uh, to come and see me graduate, as she would always say, it was one of the highest points of her life. And yet still to this day, what a... Um, getting on, you know, your webinar or um, um, meeting at the Federal Reserve where I have something really major to do, I still call her before uh, to get her words of encouragement. And I think what she has demonstrated to me is that if we just simply love each other in the purest way that we can, uh, in the way that represents our humanity, and we provide the opportunity to listen to one another, uh, to respect and understand uh, each other's challenges 
and to be the cheerleaders that we can be, uh, not necessarily by doing the big things, but simply by being good to each other every simple every single day. I think there's a lot more progress that we can make than any technology or any other major legislation would ever provide for us. It's a wonderful note to end on, and I would only underscore that with uh, something I was going to bring up at the beginning but skipped over it, which is that the first time you and I met, uh, we were with Vernon Jordan, and uh, Vernon has been, uh, I know, a great friend and mentor to you. And many years ago, when I was in my 20s, Vernon turned to me and he said, Willie, I can give you one piece of advice, which is, talk to your mother every day. And um, I have not been able to live up to Vernon's uh, advice as it relates to talking to my mom every day, but I try to talk to my mom as much as I can. And you bringing up the fact that you spoke to your grandmother. And, and also, I will tell you, Dr. Frederick, I didn't, when, I, when, I, when I read about her, I didn't expect for her to still be alive. And so I'm thrilled to hear that she is still alive and just celebrated her birthday. Um, I greatly appreciate you coming on and sharing your thoughts. I know you're jumping off this to go to something else immediately, so I'm going to let you jump. To everyone who joined us today, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Frederick, thanks for your insights and your thoughts. Good luck getting Howard back uh, online this fall, whether in physical classes or actually online, and I look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Be safe and healthy. Thank you.